G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. And what idea is more dangerous than that your empathy is actually something that is leading you astray? And you need to be more rigorously rational, maybe less empathic. Maybe you feel other people's pain too much. Maybe you use the claim of your own pain and suffering and victimization too much. Today's guest is one of the world's leading moral philosophers, Paul Bloom. He works a lot in moral psychology. He looks at the development of our sense of right and wrong when we're babies. He looks at our intuitions about moral responsibility, the role that anger and disgust and empathy play in our lives. Most controversially, he wrote a book called Against Empathy in 2016. That is the bulk of this conversation, me trying to tease out exactly what he means. Like, shouldn't we all be more empathic? Shouldn't we have a broader empathic imagination towards our opponents? Paul throws a few wrinkles into that. It makes for a very interesting conversation and very interesting thinking. His other books include The Sweet Spot, How Pleasure Works, and Just Babies, The Origin of morality in little kids. This is fascinating, especially the interplay between social media algorithms, artificial intelligence, and how we know what is right and what is wrong. I hope you enjoyed this convo with the one and only Paul Bloom. Let's start with with empathy. What's wrong with empathy? Uh, so, you know, I, I wrote a book called Against Empathy and got a lot of, uh, it was the most controversial thing I've ever written. And people use the term in different ways. So sometimes people use the term empathy just to mean kindness, compassion, love. I'm not against that. What I am against is empathy in the sense of putting yourself in another person's shoes, feeling what they're feeling. And I'm only against that in a specific way. I'm against that as using, and I'm against using empathy in that sense as a guide to our decisions about right and wrong. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that empathy is very biased. So if you think about the people that you personally find it easy to experience what they're experiencing, to see the world through their eyes, it'll be people who look like you. People who, who, you know, other, other, you know, white guys of your age, you know, speak your language. And, you know, same for me, same for everybody. And, um, and that biases our moral decision-making. When, you, when you, you use your heart to make moral decisions, it'll always going to turn out your moral decisions are just biased in favor of people who look like you. Um, empathy, I think, ignores numbers. It, it, you, know, you feel empathy for individuals, not for, um, not for uh, groups as a whole. But sometimes the right moral decision involves paying attention to numbers, realizing that 100 lives is worth more than, than one. I could go on. Yeah. Well, let's start with bias. Isn't that just, doesn't that just mean that uh, that uh, a, a empathy without reason is bad? But we need to adjust our empathy. I mean, isn't the isn't the point of having an empathic imagination that you can you can think to yourself, oh, even though this person looks different to me and lives in a different country from me, that they're my, I should extend my empathy towards them. I mean, I, it's my it's my almost my duty to modify my empathy using reason? Or is that the kind of overriding of empathy that you're talking about? I, I view that as overriding. I agree we could do it. We could struggle. You could have empathy for your worst enemy in the world, for the person who wishes you dead. The person doesn't respect you. I mean, you, doesn't you're, you're saying struggle as if you need, as if it's it runs counter to empathy, but I'm talking about an expansion of empathy and that if you were simply a cold AI robot, you might you might be denuded of something that's crucial yeah. to, to extending, uh, you know, to doing the right thing because you wouldn't be able to feel what it's like to be another person. So is it, is it the opposite of empathy to feel empathy for everybody or is, is that just better empathy? So, so two things. So you, you're raising a couple of good points. One thing is that, um, that empathy by its very nature doesn't flow to everybody. You, you feel tremendous empathy for a child, for somebody you're close to. You can feel empathy maybe for, for, you know, for a rat, for a pig, for your enemy, but it is work. It is a struggle. It doesn't come naturally. If you, maybe you're a saint and maybe for you, you know, free love just flows to everybody. Most of us don't work that way, but, but important. Um, I'm not saying we should be cold, bloodless robots. I think that intelligence and reason in the absence of feeling doesn't lead to morality at all. You have no motivation to care about people to do good things. I just think that the caring, the compassion, the love, 
the desire to be a good person can be separated from the sort of spotlight, laser focus of empathy. You could want to be a good person because you care about people, because you want to do the right thing. But as soon as you start zooming in on people, you zoom in on some people. What's an example of that in real life? Oh, gosh. Um, charity. People um, people give enormous amounts of charity to their neighbors, to, to people, other wealthy people who are close by, to stories they hear involving people suffering in some dramatic way that they could, they could feel for them. And they tend not to put their money into things that actually make a difference, that improve people's lives. One of the interesting movements over the last many years is effective altruism. And effective altruism says, look, yeah, don't go with your heart. Don't go with your feelings. Rather, ask yourself the somewhat cold-blooded question. So first, first you want to help, and that's not cold-blooded at all. But now ask yourself the cold-blooded question, where can my money do the most good? What can I, what can I cause uh, the most help? Why, you know, why, I, yeah, sorry, finish that thought. No, just, just an example. I, I was once, I was actually once on a radio show and, um, and I described, you know, uh, being approached by child beggars in, in India um, and, and realizing, because people told me, that, you know, this isn't the best way to give your money because these kids actually, they take the money, but they're, they're rather in, almost enslaved by adults and you're encouraging a system that causes more suffering. And the person I, I was also on the show was shocked and she said, you know, when the child asks me to help and holds out the hand, I, I help. I don't, I don't do all of this rational, you know, mumbo jumbo. And at the time, you know, because I'm naturally slow and, and, and I always think of things like, like a year later, I didn't know what to say. But now I know what to say, which is, it depends what you want. If you want to feel really good, get a rush. Listen to your heart. Give to people who ask. Um, look at their smiling faces as you help them. If you want to actually help people, you might have to do something different. Mm. Why help at all in the absence of yeah. empathy? Um, because we have other moral emotions, we have compassion. We could care for people. I could care. For, I could care for somebody, even though I don't put them, myself in their shoes. I, I I hear about people suffering in a war, and where where there's at least there's several wars going on as we're talking now. To, as this thing comes comes alive, there'll be several more. Um, and I could say, oh my God, it's horrible. I, I there's so much suffering, and I want to help, but I don't have to say, oh, I know exactly what that feels like. I know what it feels like to have terrorists come in and shoot my children. I know what it feels like to have bombs raining over my head. I, I, I actually, I don't know what it feels like, and I don't have to. I could just say, look, there's, there's bad stuff going on, and I think we should be morally obliged to help. You mentioned the numbers uh, game as well, how empathy can mislead us on numbers. Can you articulate that? Yeah, there's actually laboratory studies on that showing that you, you tell people, you know, you, this is some, some really nice, nice work done um, by some behavioral economists. You tell people, you get to vote your money to helping 10, 10 people and really improve the lives of 10 people. Then you tell another person, you can devote your, you can spend your money, same amount of money to helping the life of one person. But here's her picture and here's her name. The people in the second group, who was a one, give more than the group of the 10. And, you know, in, in everyday life, we see so many cases where a singular victim draws immense sympathy and caring. And that's really nice. Except when you multiply them, something blurs. It becomes, oh, it's a number. 100 people, 200 people, 5,000 people. What do I care? I, the emotions resonate to individuals. Right. And so, so empathy, if, if uh, a morality just, just based on empathy is, is an enumerate one. It feels like woolly-headed sentimentality is what you're attacking, <laughs> and that if yeah. we could make empathy the most expansive grounding, yeah. So how how do you avoid the we're all just going to do a highly rational calculus and in a cold-blooded way uh, attempt to output the most utilitarian uh, outcome, and then strip that of so much emotion that people don't feel compelled to give at all or to be moral yeah. at all. So I was going to say, I, I don't avoid that at all. I think that's what we should do. I think if you want to make the world a better place, you want to help people, then not just in charity, but helping the people you love, the people around you, being a, a good person, you should think in, in a kind of cold-blooded, rational way, say, what will do the most, the most good? But you're right. You need something to give you a kick in the pants, right? You need some way to care. And, and for that, there's other things. There's, um, there, there's, I think, compassion. There's love. I think sometimes there's other emotions like anger, you know, 
and people from Martin Luther King Jr. on have pointed out the, the force of anger, righteous anger, in making the world a better place. And so you got to anger fueling you. So I'm, I'm not fixing. I see, I see injustices being done. But then the question comes up, how? And then I think we should be rational, cold-blooded, utilitarian maximizers yeah. and, and so on. Right. Um, I mean, who could be in favor of being woolly-headed? <laughs> well, uh, the, the straw man version of you that people attack you for being is the person who could be in favor of being woolly-headed, uh, Paul. Um, I'm a- I'm a softy. I mean, that's that's why I wrote. That's why I wrote. One reason I wrote the book was because I'm a very empathy driven guy, and I've kind of noticed that as a result of my empathy, sometimes things just don't get any better. I feel good. I've sort of scratched an itch, and so I start to look towards other people who really do make the world a better place, and I see how they do. Another one example of the have the potential pitfalls of empathy that you give is victims' impact statements in like a, the justice system. Can you just articulate that because they're they're quite popular and the idea of having sort of mediation sessions between perpetrator and victim is becoming more popular. What's the hazard there? Yeah, um, I'm actually thinking of, of something almost the opposite of the of the the mediation sessions where. At least, I don't know if they still do this, at least in, in the United States courts, sometimes people who are victims of crimes give a statement about how they've been victimized, maybe how the death of somebody was murdered affected them, maybe how they were traumatized by their rape or their assault. And, um, and it, it turns out that, that the punishment that somebody is given depends radically on the victim statement. If you are an attractive, articulate young woman and you describe yourself being victimized, it really moves people. If you are quiet and you don't cry and you don't make a big deal, people give less of a sentence. And that's a terrible way to do the justice system. I mean, you know, I, I, I think punishment is a necessary evil. We have to punish people for doing wrong or else people continue to do wrong. And I think we should be sensitive to the suffering somebody causes. But an empathy-driven system just skews things on facts that we know upon reflection shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Whether, whether the relatives of somebody who was killed are really articulate in describing their pain as opposed to stoic. Should it matter if they actually experienced more hurt? Yeah. I think, I, I think from a legal point of view, maybe you don't want to titrate it that closely, but from a moral point of view, you know, it's, it's complicated, but probably I, I think the more pain you cause, particularly if you know about it, the more pain you knowingly cause, the worse of an act that you do. Mm. We you can know, even just, uh, yes. Yeah, so, well, I was going to say we can even think of examples where the perpetrator themselves and their charmingness or uh, callousness can can then taint the outcome. I mean, I'm thinking of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard's trial and their mannerisms. I'm thinking of the classic case in Australia of Lindy Chamberlain, who Meryl Streep played in that movie about the the dingo taking her baby, who was. Who seemed cold and um, and un, uh, unemotional during the trial, which gave people lots of suspicion that she had actually killed the child instead of it having been an accident. There are there are all kinds of ways in which we just sort of smell a lack of yeah yeah. That's 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 a great example. I mean, now now we're away from empathy and towards other, other yeah. Things. What is that? That's where well, you know um, there's an attractiveness bias. Your 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 good looking defendant will get off easier than your ugly one. There's you know what you're talking about charm, uh, not just for civil cases but also for criminal cases. How 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 you appear, how sympathetic you are, and you know it's it's a terrible way to run a justice system. I mean, isn't that still empathy in the sense that those the the characteristics that the perpetrator exi- is exhibiting are not is not empathy, but what's being triggered in the onlooker strikes me as so, empathy. It right? could be. It could be. Like, I could how could that. this mother be behaving this way after she's just lost her child? I lack a, right. a sense of being in her shoes. Whereas if she was crying, I'd I'd understand it more. I'd feel more empathy towards her plight. I think that's right. I think I think people with a certain amount of charm have the gift of getting other people to see the world as they do. Mm. And people without the charm um, don't. Don't people, people say you're not, you know, how come the mother's not crying? How come the mother's not behaving as I would behave? She must have been some way implicated in it. And, um, you know, I haven't followed the Depp, her trial. Uh, one of my friends said, <laughs> Congratulations. One, one sort of thing I decided to, to, to sort of stay out of. But I, I was told a lot of people just found her extremely unsympathetic. And 
And if they found her unsympathetic because her, her case isn't wasn't a strong one, that's one thing. But they found her unsympathetic because of her facial expressions or how she moved or her her the tone of voice, then you really want to somehow build a, a, a moral system and a justice system in particular that's not sensitive to those things. Mm. So let's define empathy versus compassion versus sympathy because I still feel in my gut, and maybe the gut is the wrong place to be doing the thinking about this, that the question about empathy, that you you are objecting to trusting our immediate first empathic response but I don't see how you get to, you know, take Israel and Gaza or whatever, or Ukraine and Russia. I, I don't see how you get to walk a mile in another person's shoes without trying to expand your sphere of empathy such that you're not merely taking pity on the side that you're politically opposed to. You're not merely trying to feel compassion for people with their limbs blown off. You're actually trying to comprehend in an empathic way, that there are there are two sides here, or that there are people who are genuinely having their life aspirations pulled out from underneath them, in order to be less partisan and less biased in your politics. Is there no place for that? I think there's different levels of what you're asking for. I think what we should try to do is understand these clashes, understand, you know, if you're as an Israeli, you should understand the Palestinians. Your Palestinians should understand the Israelis. You, you, and as a third party, you should try to understand what's going on in both. But that's but, a very hard mm-hmm. thing to do. I mean, you can gloss over that yep. in, in one sentence no, no, very I, quickly. I, oh, you should I, try no. to do this. You should try to do that. But obviously, people don't do that. And it's enormously wrenching for them to try to do that. So to what on the shelf are they reaching for in order to do that, if not empathy? No, I, I, think, I think what I'm saying is difficult. What you are asking is much harder, which is... The Israeli not only has to look at the Palestinians and say, okay, I, I see you have a grievance. I see this. I see you, you, you know, your, your position is that. But I'm going to see the world through your eyes. In fact, I want to see the world through your eyes and look at, at me and my friends and my family and appreciate your genuine you know, animus towards us, that, that how you really and, and feel sympathy for this. I'm going to look at B- bin Laden and say, I see what that guy was. I, I get it now. I see. I see why he did what he did. I think true empathy in that case, it's it's difficult enough for me to feel empathy for my true empathy for my wife or my kids, <laughs> for people who want to kill me, and they only they occasionally want to kill you, uh, your wife and kids, <laughs> that's right, which is that's an right. upside. Well, you know, we could we could we could talk about that. We've had a relationship <laughs> between love, love and hate, um, but but I think. You're asking for something which, in some way, is 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 beautiful if we could do it. But I think you're asking for too much. I think what you want to do is you want to you want to sort of approach the sides fairly, understand their grievances. Here's another case: um, Hillary Clinton uh, at one point said, "What you have to do to understand to to deal with race problems in America is somebody like me has to sort of feel what it's like to be a black kid who deals with the cops and is afraid of the cops and angry at the cops." And my reaction to that is, I can't do that. I like, I like the cops. The cops have always been nice to me, given my skin color and my age and so on. So why? what about instead of trying that, instead of trying to figure out what it's like to be a woman who's sexually harassed, what it's like to be a Palestinian, why don't I just try to say, well, listen, limps, what's just, what's right, what's fair? What do people want? What's being done to them? Treat it you know, a little bit more coldly without fully immersing yourselves and it's more it's more tangible more practical and um and i think when people try often often there's an arrogance to empathy you know imagine me talking to some woman who's a victim of sexual harassment say i I know what that feels like you know a little while ago somebody whistled at me man i know that feels good (laughs) you know i say i have my own perspective and it's but that's thing. not empathy, is it, Paul? I mean, that's not empathy. It's not, it's, that's parachuting your point of view on top of hers. Actual empathy would be listening to her experience, recognizing that your experience differs from her experience, and trying to take the imaginative leap to what it would to what that would be like. I mean, I feel personally and, that I, that my mind has been changed on certain social justice issues just by really trying to grok what it's like to have people look at you a certain way or treat you a certain way all the bloody time. And the fact that I can't 
feel exactly what that's like is one more reason why it's important for me to expand my empathy in order to insert a new perspective on the world into my worldview. And I don't know how that that jigsaw piece of the mosaic of my worldview genuinely gets inserted without me trying to utilize my own empathy to understand what that other person is feeling. That doesn't mean that feelings are the the be all and end all and that I don't use reason as well, but it strikes me that there's a dance between the two. Do you think you need to be successful at this to be a good person? Probably. To okay. some extent, yeah. I think it would be hard to be an a, a completely unempathic uh I, th- I think it would it would likely be an asset. I mean, if you if you take two hypothetical human beings, one of whom has all of the right information about the world, and the other of whom has all the right information about the world, and can try to uh, experience things as well, the latter would be in in better stead. If the latter succeeded, I probably would agree with you, but. I think you could have the right to treat somebody properly, someone who is the victim of rape or a terrorist attack or something, without knowing what it's like. I think um, I think we tend to sort of um, exaggerate how easy it is to get ourselves in the head of as other people, in part because, to use your term, we parachute in. We say, I, 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 I could figure it out. And I kind of, you do kind of imagine it. I think sometimes, by the way, the attempt that you're talking about, if it's successful, is wonderful. Sometimes it, when you fail, it, it leads to a certain coldness. So people, I've heard many people say, you know, dealing with the victims of discrimination of some sort, they say, you know, I know I can imagine what that's like and it's not so bad. You know, maybe they're right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe the people who are complaining are just complaining and making a lot of noise. But in some sense, they're putting a lot of confidence in their empathic attempt. And... We know, we know from, from all sorts of studies that we're just not good at it. Here, here's a simple example. There's, there, there's been experiments where you try to get able-bodied people to imagine what it's like to be blind or in a wheelchair or deaf or something like that. And you get them really to focus on it, to simulate it, to think about it hard. And then what they always say is, if I, was, I now know what it's like to be blind, I'd kill myself. It'd be horrible. But they aren't imagining what it's like to be blind. They're imagining what it's like to be someone who can see, and all of a sudden you lose that. And that is horrible. But after, after six months, after a year, after 10 years, it's not horrible anymore. You adapt. But we're not good at simulating that. Right. Which side of politics is doing more empathy peddling? Uh, because uh, superficially, it seems like the, the sort of, you know, the current uh, progressive fad for my own lived experience and, you know, as a white cisgender male, uh, I feel this, and as a woman of color, I feel that, and as a survivor of this, I feel that. Uh, There is a sense in which your own experience gives you a trump card, and it seems to me that there's an underlying assumption there that anyone who hasn't had that experience has no standing to uh, to have a conversation with you, even about, you know, rational policy discussions you have to have had the experience in order to have any standing but then on the other side i see a total almost um proud uh, blasting through of any concern for empathy where it's like uh just get over yourself snowflake (laughs) right uh and uh, we should uh, you know anything that relates to feeling or your sensation about how you move through the world is illegitimate as the basis for a conversation. What do you make of those two positions? I think you've captured exactly right. Progressives talk empathy. They talk live experience. They talk about about your own personal thing. And you know, people on the right tend to dismiss a lot of this talk as snowflake talk and so on. But when it comes to actual political reasoning and moral reasoning, I think both sides use empathy a lot. So you gave a lot of good examples of how the left uses it, and and, and they do use it. But people on the right use it in almost parallel ways. So Trump, who may be one of the least empathic humans you would ever encounter, is, is masterful at using empathy to make his arguments. So a lot of his anti-immigration stuff, which he's been doing less, you know, but his, uh, early in his, in his uh, presidential run, he really pushed crimes done by immigrants. And he would tell moving stories 
about people who have been horribly assaulted and murdered by him. And he would get his audience to feel what it's like to be them, to use in their, you know, to, to use to, to, for his political goals. Somebody on the left, a sort of, you know, anti-Trump, would talk about what it's like to be a refugee coming to America and facing discrimination because people hate you and so on. And so much of political discourse is, you know, an empathy argument. You're going to care about the person who is, um, who is uh, shot because somebody left a gun in the house and somebody, you know, their, their child commits suicide and it's horrible. You shouldn't have guns around. You're going to care about the person who's victimized by a savage criminal because the government took away their guns. Mm-hmm. You're going to focus on a woman who can't have an abortion. Her life is ruined. You're going to focus on, on a baby murdered by an abortionist. You got And for each one, you could go flip back and forth. Now, there's some, there's some political positions, even some I like, that, don't, that aren't amenable to, to empathy. So if you care about climate change, there's actually very little few empathy arguments for climate change. If you care about free speech, there aren't many good Why are there arguments. few empathy arguments for climate change? I think I could articulate an empathy argument on both sides. I think one, one so, would be, uh, you know, yep. or the, the plight of workers who've been systematically screwed over uh, for who work in fossil fuel industries, exactly. uh, their, you know, their towns being wiped out. And on the other side, there would be, think about your children and grandchildren who are going to live in a much more expensive and chaotic world. Indeed, we in 30 years, but mostly yeah. our kids and grandkids. But there's the asymmetry. You're right. You could, you could try that. Um, but here's the asymmetry. For the um, for the workers, or people who are screwed by a gas tax, which they can't afford, or something like that, you could pull out a man or a woman and say, "Look at this person. Let me tell you about this person." For the future, you say, "Well, hypothetically, in twenty or thirty years, individuals will suffer from this, that, and other." And and part of me, you know, the part of me that's sway- swayed by empathy is, "Show me." Mm. Well, I can show you statistical. Right. You know, also, even if same, you can show the person right now, the people who are most impacted by climate change first tend to be poor and maybe darker skinned exactly. and foul away, so they're less. Exactly. I mean, let me, let me, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe the, the, the presence of climate catastrophes increasingly, whether that's the Maui bushfires or the Canadian bushfires or the Australian bushfires or increased hurricanes is a way of bringing the empathic reality of that home. No? That's right. That's right. That That would help. It's it's never entirely honest because you can't point to any specific thing and say ah that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for climate change. But no, but I think people to, like, I think people have gotten over that. I think yeah. that there's enough now that people's common sense, uh, you know, even in terms of snow coming later, everyone everyone who's been looking at weather systems who's been alive for twenty years or more can see that something's happening now that wasn't happening previously. I think even if you can't pin each specific event. No, may, maybe you're right. It's one of the. It's a. It's hardly a good thing, but one of the benefits of the world getting worse. We had climate. You could actually find identifiable victims. Yeah. Or or take um, uh, you know, take free speech issues on on campus. I mean, I know you're interested in. And um, my friend uh, Greg Luciano just has a book on on. Yeah, he's. He, I've just people. interviewed him actually. Yeah, and Ricky. I'm, yeah. I'm not surprised. That's there is. Um, and so. Suppose you, you, you talk, somebody says something incredibly offensive on campus, a professor, a visiting speaker, and everything. It really hurts people. On the side of repressing their speech, you could think, imagine, imagine what it would feel like to feel unwell, to feel endangered on campus, to feel humiliated by someone else's words. Now, the case for free speech is, oh, well, the open currency of ideas encourages more ideas and allows for blah, 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 blah. And I find that, that argument very persuasive, but it's not a very empathic one. It's a very cold one. Mm. Is there a way to insert empathy into that argument? Well, so so here's here's where where maybe you and I have it. That, that's that's a perfectly good question, um, and one could always ask this, saying that how do we appeal to people's emotions like empathy when making a political or moral argument and sway them, but maybe get people out of the habit of looking for those things. You know, you ever see the, you know, every president giving a State of Union speech at one point you know, tells a story. Let me tell you a story. You know, I remember when, when we were arguing about health care, politicians reach into their breast pocket, pull out a piece of paper. Like that. I got a letter from a 11 year old named Marcy. And then it would be some sort of thing, either how health care killed her father or saved her father. And I think people should just start booing when that happens <laughs> and, say, and say, we're not children. They should treat it like a, like an openly race, racist appeal. 
They should say, I know that stuff works, Stop, but stop trying to use it. Mm. Make arguments. Mm. Yeah. But until then, maybe maybe we should, we, we do need to appeal to emotions. There's a kind of, I feel like we're, we're groping around underneath a meta conversation about empathy, Paul, which is that there's, the, there are the, all, I take all of your criticisms about uh, you, trusting empathy as our principal guide for reasoned decision making and the, the ways in which that's flawed. But so much of what's happening in the world at the moment, it strikes me, comes from, and I'm not just talking about wars, I'm just talking about like our cultural strife as well and our misunderstandings of each other and our partisanship, comes from uh, a certain intellectual arrogance. Um, I see more and more self-certainty. I see less and less humility. I see more stridency. And the way I think of my job is to create greater intellectual empathy for one's own fallibility for other people's, the possibility that other people are right, you know, checking myself to recognize that, of course, I think that I'm right, because that's what human beings do. There are other people who are as convinced that they're as right as I am. So it, for me, it's an empathic leap to say, it's entirely possible that I'm right. It's also entirely possible that this other person who also feels just as right as I do is right. Yeah. Is that empathy? I wouldn't, well, put it this way. If if it isn't that kind of empathy, I'm in favor of. If if you're talking about the act of intellectual humility, of respecting other people's views, of entertaining the idea you could be wrong, and this person who's usually don't like and doesn't like you could be right, um, I wouldn't normally call that empathy. But I don't want to argue about about the words. It's a good thing, whatever you call it. And um, and and I gotta say, I'm I'm in favor of reason and rationality, and and I think. And I think these things get a bad rap. I think this is really the core of, of a lot of goodness in the world. And our gut feeling is the core of a lot of evil. But it does, that doesn't mean that everybody who says they're using their reason and rationality is doing so correctly or in good faith. A lot of, a lot of people just talk a good reason game. And they're just kind of yelling about their own prejudices just loudly and in a certain tone of voice. Mm. And, uh, and so so there is, there is a sort of stridency and... and I feel this, this, there's all sorts of forces which have led to sort of a coarsening of discourse. And, um, and some of it is emotion driven, but I will agree that some of it is with people who would describe themselves as being on my side. Yeah. And you're confident that if you start heckling the politician who pulls out the letter from the 11 year old girl, you aren't also going to turn down our empathy for other people's intellectual positions. Um, I'm confident that if we act, if we insist on a sort of respect from politicians and, and try to blunt emotional appeals, that that would have good effects. And the analogy I think of is racist appeals. So just like empathic appeals, racist appeals work very well. Look at these people, they're different color than you. You know, look at these people who are being victimized. Look at look, they look like you. They're very successful. And it must be very tempting for even a very good politician, good goals to say, I wonder if I could kind of appeal to sort of racist tendencies on the part of the voters to get this good end. You know, maybe there's a terrible politician they want to stop and the politician happening to be black. Can I use racism to do it? And, you know, as a utilitarian, I think this is kind of complicated, but I think in general we should try to we should try to play fair and treat people with respect. And we might lose some small battles, but in the long run. It will be better. But again, surely racism is the ultimate lack of empathy. Oh, no. Racism, in some, I mean, in some sense, racism is the ultimate lack. In other words, I mean, you're, again, I'm just saying that you, what you seem to be criticizing is a very woolly-headed, sentimental, and, uh, and constrained version of empathy. The solution could be the one that you propose, which is to uh, dis-empathy. But the solution could also be to create a more expansive vision of what empathy looks like. So I think racism and empathy are connected in a sense. I mean, obviously, racism is sort of being trying to unempathic, un uncompassionate to a lot of people. But it's also focusing on your group, caring about those who look like you, caring about your tribe, caring deeply and lovingly, putting yourself in their shoes. It's just if you if you if you turn up that dial very much, it starts to fade out everyone who's not in your in your tribe. Um I, I kind of agree with you in principle. 
if we could make it so that we could put ourselves in the shoes of everybody, care equally, that the scales are matched equally for your 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 brother, your son, your wife, and those people you know across the way who have you know murdered your people in the past and your arch enemies. If you can make the scales equal through empathy, then that's one problem. Bias would go away. You'd have unbiased empathy, and empathy would be something you draw upon. It's just not how we work. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like saying, you know, um, well, we treat attractive people for trials and those are better than unattractive. And if we just stop doing that, that'd be really nice. But that's actually not how it works. We, 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 we make progress when we sort of set up procedures and ways to block bias. But bias is fundamental mm. to us. We what, have to be, they'd be angels. It, it, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, what impact is social media and our current media environment having on all this? Because when you talk about cherry picking examples that trigger our empathic response, I just see an Instagram feed right there, oh right? I mean, this is, you know, taking any one of these hot button issues. If you're, uh, you know, if you're a an anti-trans person, then your feed is yep. full of uh, these poor teenagers who've been butchered and now regret having had mastectomies because of their gender dysphoria. And if you're pro-trans, then all you see are these poor people who don't have access to health care because of bills that have been passed in Republican states that deprive trans people of health care. And it plucks the heartstrings. Like, it, you know, it, it, it system, the algorithm systematically reinforces things that you already believe and demonizes positions that you don't. So in a way, it, it, it's a way of reducing your empathy towards the other and increasing your empathy towards the tribe. On, on the topic of empathy, you're making my argument better than I could make it. I mean, it, it, it's exactly right. So, so what you see on social media, and I'm on Twitter, right, X, way too much, is... Um, is empathic um, traps in where they focus you on. They say, look, look at this kid who was denied health care of a certain sort. And look at how, how wretched their life is. Cry for them. And the weird thing, because of social media, we always had those things. But now, if I'm anti-trans, I'll get a steady diet of those things, giving me empathy, pushing the anti-trans position. If, I, if I'm pro-trans rights, I'll get the flip side. If I'm... If I'm um, if I'm certainly now of the conflict, if I'm, you know, one person will go on, on X and see endless videos and the reenactments and stories about people uh, who have been, you know, murdered, raped, tortured in the, in the Hamas attack of a couple of weeks ago. If you're a different kind of person, you'll get, I'm sure this is when, when, we're to, when, this, when this shows up, the situation will change, but you, you will get videos and descriptions of babies, children suffering in Gaza due to Israeli attacks. And this is the predictable thing. It, make, it makes us zoom in. It, makes, it entrenches our views. Yeah. It's not just information where the Trump supporter gets a different diet of information than a person who doesn't like Trump. It, it's, it's feelings. And it's, 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 it's terrible. I mean, you talked before about your goal to sort of expand the intellectual circle and get people thinking about the other side. Social media does the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a... There's an interesting, you know, and I'm sure you'll want to distance yourself from this instinct, but there's something which uh, which strikes me as at least tangentially related to what you're talking about, which is a, a kind of a big-brained tech bro uh, attitude towards empathy, which is also anti-empathic and seeks to kind of dunk on what all the sheeple have been misled to believe by powerful institutions. So, like, a, a few times recently on Twitter... I've seen uh, a debunking of this individual who seems to be a Hamas uh, terrorist, but who poses as uh, a young Gazan yeah. freedom fighter. And he's been, so he's got, there's, Im- there's, there's images of him in a hospital bed in Gaza, almost dying. Then there's footage of him in the terrorist attacks, uh, you know, killing people. Then there's footage of him in some other scenario in Gaza as a bomb is raining down. And I was sort of tempted to retweet it because I thought, oh, this is interest. This is kind of interesting that, like, you know, even the most heartfelt images that are coming out of Gaza are sometimes manipulated. And then I thought, hang on a second, what the fuck does that matter? There's one guy who's misleading people, maybe fifty guys who are misleading people. Does that change the fact that thousands of people are suffering? That thousands of people are 
are dying. It's like there's an instinct to be anti-empathic and to be like, oh, I'm the smart guy in the room here. Everybody look at me. I've got the solution. I've got the thing that you guys are being misled using your dumb empathic emotions into believing. And I can lift the veil and show you why you're wrong. And th- it strikes me that social media also enhances that. The smart ass who knows better than everybody else because he's not fooled by empathy. Yeah, I, I agree. You can't you can't always pick your allies. And and there is a sort of and and, and I, I know the kind of person you're talking about is sort of a uh yeah, I should say a, a tech bro type who is extremely proud of his, usually his intelligence, and 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 sneers at other people who get caught up in emotions and um and lords it over people and so on. And you know, I think I'm not there, there's a lot of sins going on here. There, there's intellectual arrogance. There's often a tribalism, which is these people would be the first, to, you know, the last to admit that they have any tribal instincts. But but they care. The people who matter are a very small band of people they associate with. And there's often a tremendous indifference and sort of sneeringness towards the rest of the world. Mm. Um, so and and also they're also missing something which which you mentioned before, and I am sensitive to, which is all of us. Rationality is extremely, once you have a goal, you want to be rational, figure out how to get to the goal. How do you, you know, we have this thing in the Middle East. What's the best way to resolve it? What side should we support? Um, what charity should you give to? And so on. But you also got to persuade people to want to do these things. And for that, you know, reasons, logic doesn't motivate people. You got to motivate people. Mm-hmm. And I think there are dangers to motivating people with, you know, videos of people getting their heads chopped off or crying babies and all of that. But you do need you do need to appreciate that 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 it's emotions that drive us and try to nurture caring and compassion. Mm. You have to make people want to hear other sides. You have to make people want to make the world better. You have to make people hope that there's that there's a chance of doing so and not become sort of, you know, nihilistic about the whole thing. And Paul, what do you make of moments where we all come around some very emotionally charged uh, story of goodwill or hope or tragedy or something? And every time that happens, you'll have people sniping from the sidelines saying, why do we care so much about this? Sometimes those people include me. Uh, but, you know, the like the Russian submarine that was at the bottom of the ocean yeah. or the Thai cave children, they're stuck in a cave. Are they going to get out? Oh, you know, it's, it's like it's it transfixes the world. And I've always felt a little bit like I'm halfway along the spectrum because I'm like, why do we give a shit about these Thai kids? I mean, uh, like, you know what I mean? Like, yes, of course, it's uh, like tragic yeah, for them. But... With... So I, 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 I look at those cases and on the one hand, I roll my eyes because you get tremendous resources and tremendous people's energy and and attention and emotions and tons and tons of money and time devoted for, to saving you know a little girl stuck in a well well you know there could be a famine someplace else and that was i mean there almost but certainly is a famine somewhere there's, else. Almost, there's always a famine yeah. somewhere else and but nobody gives a nobody cares about the kids because 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 they're the wrong color and they're too far away and they're not adorable so i i am the sniper on that one However, I'm also a sucker. You know, you tell me about the Thai cave kids, I'd tear up when I hear it. Mm. You know, so um, so again, you know, I'm I, I I can't be too superior about the draw of these emotions because I think I'm probably more vulnerable to them than, than a lot of people. You mentioned tribalism, Paul, and that's that's one thing that you've written about that I'd like to get into, like our our sense of having an in group or a, an out group. Um, I don't remember which book you were talking about, the Rattlers and the Eagles uh, yeah. study. Can you explain that? Um, there's a lot. It, 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 it's, I don't know if the Eagles study actually has been discredited. Oh. It's the story behind it. Yes, it's, it's a, so, but what's really clear is that we are biased. Certainly, you know, once we're young children, at maybe maybe babies, there's some there's some debate about that. But universally, to break the world to us versus them. You have, you have a simple study where you give you get kids in a in a classroom. Half of them wear red t shirts, half of them wear blue t shirts, and almost the instant they put on the t shirts, they say their group is better, smarter, nicer. They'll give more money to their group, and so on. And it's a simple switch in our heads in 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 group versus out group, and it is. Um, I think it is. It, it may well be inevitable, and something you have to work around. But it's a source of, 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 of so much ugliness in the world. Mm. 
Yeah. Is it inevitable? I mean, can you turn the volume up and the volume down? Do we know? Yeah. For, for just about all of this, you could turn the volume up and the volume down. But I think I think for somebody like me, say I'm I'm, you know, born in Canada, I'm a professor, I'm 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 Jewish, I you know, have all these, you know, certain age uh, uh heterosexual and so I'm always gonna care more more and more empathy, but more compassion, more love to people I see as falling to my groups. You know, it's like I see another professor who's got my hey, they give him the nod, you know, and well, well, the rest of the world they're just not not in my in my group. And intellectually, I can I know we're all people, but but there's a warmth, a real caring. You know, I had a colleague of mine uh, is uh, is Korean, and um, and she had a fundraiser at her house for a Korean politician, Korean American politician running for office, um, and nobody's surprised. Nobody's surprised, you know, when, when I when I was Jewish, a, a Jewish kid, Jewish family being raised in my show, we'd send money to Jews in, in Russia. So why didn't we send money to, to the Kurds or to Hindis or whatever? Yeah. Well, because you, you, you connect to your people. Um, Is that ethical? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it is so ingrained in us that as long as it wasn't causing harm, um, well, there's an opportunity cost to everything, so there's yes, some yes. applied harm. Yes. I don't think it's optimal. I think it would be better if my family back there said, who needs this the most? What can we do the most good? Instead of assuming that, who are our people in trouble? But then, you, I, I mean, then, of course, the, you know, the Jewish charity would say that if all Jews had taken that attitude, then Jews would have been wiped out thousands of years ago yeah. because they're always the persecuted minority and it's only by banding together and supporting each other that they've been able to endure. To which the universalist might say, so what? Yeah. I mean, the response of the universalist is, and this this is what you were on a little bit about when I saw about the problems of empathy, is that um, what if universalism doesn't work? What if telling people care about everybody equally um, doesn't just doesn't motivate people? And people say, fine, I'll just sit this one out. And, and I worry about that because I'm very much into effective altruism. I think it's, it's this wonderful movement. But but it is true that when we're our, our best emotions often go along in group lines. You know, it's hard for me to say for, say, a woman who's been a victim of rape, who gives her money and her time to helping other women in that situation, that, oh, you're doing something wrong. You're being immoral because certainly starving children the kid, the kids, and the famine. We're talking about. They need the money more because she's doing good. Mm. It's not optimal good, but maybe optimal good is asking too much. Yeah, that's interesting, and I, and I worry about that. And it also empowers the tech bro, sniper, galaxy-brained dickhead who wants to poo-poo everybody for doing anything good because they're like, well, actually, you could be using your resources better by doing yes. X, Y, Z. And then you ask them, well, what are you doing? And they're like, well, nothing. But that's only because it would be <laughs> irrational to to pick any one charity um i was yes or 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 to people and, and I, I don't think they're dickheads they're, they're 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 people who have sincere views who say look we shouldn't be spending any money on on anything having to do with current people because in the distant future there'll be 10 to the power of a million people or probably more than that a, a, a staggering large number of people we should try to make things better for for future centuries we should worry about existential risk like ai risk and it's hard it sounds extremely cold Somebody saying, "No, don't, don't, don't send money to, to you know, to help homeless people. Mm. Send money to do AI research to stop the AIs from becoming too powerful." And it does, it does sound very cold. Yeah, you know, I, I think I, I don't want to dismiss it because I want to take arguments seriously. But I, but I appreciate how cold that sounds. Yeah, yeah. It also there's so, just something wrong with it that I can't quite put my finger on, which has to do with. Um, it's it's very zero sum. It like it, it there's something bothers me about how it assumes that we can't do more than one thing. Uh, it, it reminds me. It smells a little bit like the argument that we have before every New Year's Eve about why does Sydney Harbour spend millions of dollars on this extravagant fireworks display when there are people who could use that money so much better. It's like, come on, stop being such a killjoy. <laughs> like, do we? Have, we would never do anything fun. We would never do. We would never spend money on anything apart from just pouring it into. You know, the the neediest people. That's right. Now, if you told, if you said that he had Peter Singer on, um, and he was defending utilitarianism and everything, he would he would say, um, say, yeah, 
spend the money on people who need it the most. Then when you have stuff left over, have fireworks and art shows and theater and so on. And yeah, the life of people like ours, like us, would be greatly impoverished because we wouldn't have all of our, our fun stuff. But people, little babies who would starve to death and are in agony would be in less agony. I mean, so, I'm not even I think sure Singer would go that far. Uh, I mean, I, I think I would guess that Singer would probably say there is some marginal utility in having fireworks because it in, if you could measure the the pleasure that it gives to the million people who are standing by the harbour for sure and amortise that in some utilitarian way, then uh, maybe that can be justified, but maybe not the amounts that we spend and certainly not the amounts that rich people spend on bequeathing you yeah. know, museums and art galleries and stuff. I think Singer would say it's a matter of the math. So if you if you convinced them that the number of heat ons the millions of people got outweighed, you know, say get, curing a hundred children from blindness, mm. <laughs> then you say, good, good yeah, go ahead, yeah. That's I mean, interesting. The, the the thing I s- struggle with because I'm you know I, I I deal with it in my own life is is I I, I have family, I have a, I have children I love very much, you know, I'm married, I have I have relatives, and I put a lot more effort and focus on them than I do on, on strangers. I don't do it on anybody, actually. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm a utilitarian, but, you know, we're talking here. I want to be, I want to be honest with it. I, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. I, 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 I know the arguments that I should be spending less effort on helping my kids and more on helping with, on making a bigger difference. But I think some sort of biases are so entrenched in us, the love we have for those around us that, it, it is, you can't ask, it, it. you can't say the right thing to do is something you're incapable of doing. Why not? I think some, well, then we're all sinners in some way and we have, we'd have to live with that. And, and, and maybe, maybe that's the solution. Maybe all, maybe, maybe you're, maybe I should take that back and say, we, we all do bad then. I mean, I'm but, I, I'm with you. I don't know what to make about this. You know, and I, I hear some effective altruists uh, wrestling with the idea of whether to have children at all because it would be such a distraction of their time and resources from the bigger mission that they have to improve people's lives. Um, having children myself has certainly impeded me in, uh, you know, being able to expand my career and change minds and help people understand the world as much as I would have been able to had I not had kids but it does strike me that this you can't just be relying on a a crass utilitarian approach when it comes to parenting you would end up neglecting your own children and that just strikes me as so obviously wrong (laughs) that something's gone wrong in the math if that's the if that's the the place you end up and i agree with you but but the utilitarian would say no neglect your kids you know if you're if you're uh your podcasts are making a difference have an extra one each week and spend less time with your kids, less time with those you love. And, and to make their lives maybe a little bit less fulfilling, but just do the math. Mm. And and that, I can't I can't go that far. Yeah. But I'd like to have an argument against it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So one way of getting, one way of escaping the trap of group thinking and in-group and out-group tribalism that is plaguing us is to have some kind of a, a shared purpose uh, or a shared problem, right? You know, we always talk about if aliens attacked, then we'd all come together and, you know, all of our petty differences and squabbles would be overcome. Um, a, is that true? And B, are we living in a world where shared problems don't even look like shared problems anymore because we have prisms through which to perceive them that reliably antagonize us? See, for example, climate change. It's, it's, it's a nice idea that if we had a shared enemy, we would dissolve our, our animosities and come together to, to fight it. But I think aliens did attack. I think we had COVID. I think COVID was, it was a global pandemic. I was, I was in my house at one point, and it just occurred to me, I, I read this somewhere, that, that almost everybody on Earth was in my situation. And did this give me a shared purpose and bring the whole world together? It did not. I think that nor does climate change and so on. And I think the fact is that for just about anything, depending on where you're situated, um, it will affect you differently, and you and, and you will still have goals that will differ from other people. So you know, sort of climate goals, you know, how it would affect somebody in the United States versus Bangladesh, they're very different. Mm. And so we never quite get the situation where the aliens attack us all the same. 
Yeah. And even if we did, we'd find different solutions to the problem yeah. of the aliens. And then yes. social media algorithms would <laughs> amplify those differences. There'd be, there'd be pro-alien videos of yeah. things alien and alien atrocities. Or even if it's not pro-alien videos, just as there weren't pro-COVID videos, there would be lots of videos about why the actual, the, why the approach to attacking the aliens is actually just an excuse that people are using to hoodwink you into becoming sheep right. and, you know, obeying them in some new world order or, or whatever it might be. That's right. There, there's there's incentives within the social media. You know, part of it's just being a person, but but I think particularly for social media, there's always incentives to you know when aliens attack, say you know it's actually you know Bill Gates and so because yeah. you get a lot of followers yeah. and and you get a lot of money and so on. Um, if you know if Biden's in charge when the aliens attack, well he's messing it up and we need Trump. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, a lot of your work, Paul, is about why we like what we like and how we come to like what we like and how we come to develop a sense of good and evil when we're young. Why do why do I like the things that I like and value the things that I value? So a lot of reasons. Um, some is just is straight up natural selection. You know, if you if you give a list of what people like, people like you know, they like they like food, they like food when they're hungry and and drink when they're thirsty. Um, at stages of their life, they like sex. They always like love. They like respect. They like status. Um, they like to be warm, the right temperature, and so on. And then there's a lot about pleasure, which I find super interesting because it doesn't straightforwardly fall out from evolutionary theory. Like, why do we like art and music and stories? And that's kind of what I'm what I'm really interested in. Um, I think sometimes um, we like things because we like to. We like things in imagination because we like to simulate things. We like to. Um, there's all sorts of experiences that would be great to have, but I can't have them because you know, um, because of just I'm not situated properly, or I don't want to risk my life, or so on. So I have in my imagination. Mm. Um, I don't. Some of the things that we like, I don't know why we like. I honestly don't know the appeal of humor. I know humor is is terrific, but I've never heard a theory of humor that that I find satisfied with. Um, I don't think anybody really gets music. And um, this is why I kind of love my job, because mm -hmm. I, I could say for some of them, yeah, I got you know, pornography. I got a theory of that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but classical music? Right. So is pornography and other and movies and television shows and novels and social media, are those, are those, are those appealing because they're, I assume, representations or simulations of real life scenarios that we find titillating so so some are um some the pornography is so so people you know predominantly men but 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 it depends on the type of pornography people find certain things erotic in the world like attractive uh naked people uh of that that they're attracted to i'm familiar and, um, with the concept of pornography you, you, thank you. you get okay so it means well if you go on the internet you you know you just gotta <laughs> blow your mind so, so, but you can't always have an attractive naked person there when you need one. So you, you open up your laptop and boom, there they are, depictions of them. But it strikes the visual system as if there was somebody real and you respond accordingly. And um, sometimes we like company of attractive, amusing people, but you're alone in your house, so you switch on some sitcom or some drama and there you are. You're immersed with the cast of billions having their adventures and so on. I think that stuff is straightforward. It's almost what you call a uh, super stimulus. It's like artificial sweetener. You know, porn is the artificial sweetener of sex. It's just te technologically built, not the, not the real thing, but it hits you mm. as if it was the real thing. But then you get things like, um, you know, we're talking now and Halloween's coming up in a few days. And why do we like to be scared? Because in a real world, you know, fear's bad. If you know, if you're lying at home, you do not want actually to feel it, hearing an axe murderer come up the stairs. So why do we like that in fiction? And that's kind of a puzzle. That's a bit hard. Um, What's your hunch? Theory, I, my hunch, my hunch is it's a form of play, and what play is is practice. So what you do is for things that are dangerous, things that 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 are are dangerous and risky but important, like learning how to fight. We play. We wrestle with our friends and we, we, we get some training in a safe way. And sometimes we do this in imagination. So what, what, uh, horror movies are horror TV shows and so on is depiction worst case scenarios. 
the world the world goes to shit. You know, there's a plague wiping on everybody. There's a the, there, there's no there, there's a murder in the house. You can't trust the people around you. All those worst things ever, often in a fantastical form of zombies and vampires. But but it's but at the core, it's realistic fears, and um, and horror movies expose us to them in a safe way. Mm. I could always close my eyes, switch them off. You know, um, I could be watching Saw Four, but but I myself am never going to get hurt. Yeah. So it's ways to safely explore bad stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. It strikes me that it's a similar thing to riding a roller coaster or yeah. going bungee jumping. You know, here's here's what it would feel like to fall off a cliff. But yes. here's the kick. Here's the kicker. You're not going to die this time. Yeah. You know, you get to have the experience without the without the payoff, which is nice. Yeah. Same. And and, and to get a bit more highbrow, same with tragedies. Like, here's what it's like to have you know your family disown you and and yeah, love right. your life, leave you, and everything. and you're crying, but. It's 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 a bungee jump. Yes, you know yeah. you're not really going to get hurt. And do you, I mean, your most recent book is about why some of the things that we actually like in life are seemingly not pleasurable, uh, like suffering, and maybe that leads us here. Why do some people like to do things that aren't? Well, what kinds of things are you talking about to begin with? So this is a, this is my, my I have I have a book since then called called Psych, which is a review. You're too of, prolific. But, you're too prolific. But yeah, too pro- I, I'm sl- I'm slowing down. Um, but uh, but. Sweet spot is, is is about why we choose to to suffer, and I find it so interesting. So, and I deal with it at different levels. So, um, so there's basic sort of why do we like spicy foods? Why do we? Why do some people like BDS? And why do people? Um, why do people like roller coaster rides? You know, vertigo, which isn't so pleasant, but also why do we do things like train for a marathon or triathlon? You know, struggle. Why why do we enjoy chosen struggle, chosen suffering? Why does someone have kids, even though, you know, we know that that's not, it's not going to make life easier. It's going to make my life much harder. And I think there's different answers to that. Part of it is forms of play, forms of self-stimulation. But at root, the deeper story behind the book is that we're not hedonists. We do like pleasure. Pleasure is great. But we, but, but we also want meaning. We want meaningful activities. We want to do things that, 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 see, that are tangible. And we want to climb Mount Everest and have children and learn a new language and do hard things because we take meaning out of them. Hmm. Is there a time scale here over which the hedonism is taking place? I mean, there's a so the most short term way to feel gratified right now is to shove my face with sugary, fatty food and masturbate, probably, right? But over the long term, if I construct a life in which that's my main, uh, the main way I derive pleasure, that life is going to be vastly unfulfilling. Whereas I know that if I do things that are challenging to me, then on the other side of that, there's greater, maybe not great, greater, maybe deeper pleasure than I would get in the short term from eating a cake, eating a piece of cake. So does is, does, is there... Is timing a difference here? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Um, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi did. A, I wrote a book on flow, and um, and he points out that flow is a state of when you enter a difficult state, you you at some degree of difficulty. Not so hard you kind of freak out, but not so easy that you're bored. And it could be like artistic work or athletic stuff or music, and then you lose yourself in it. But he also points out a lot of people have lives without flow, because. They get caught up in the fact that that we are living we are living in a world where there have never been so much opportunity for eating ice cream and masturbating. It's just it's just you know there's at you, we are we have the possibility of never being bored. Mm. I walk around with my phone. I have games on and I have YouTube. I have Twitter. You know, and because of this, at an immediate time scale, hedonism always beckons, and you do need some degree of willpower and self control. To hold back on that and choose the difficulty, train, start training for a marathon, get in shape, um, learn a musical instrument, all stuff which is difficult. And I don't know. I, I've I've heard people say that that the youth of today are really screwed because they don't have. There's so many temptations. Um, when I was a kid, there were no smartphones. There's no internet, and so it's actually you didn't have a choice. You know, you learn to play a musical instrument because there's nothing else to do. Mm. It's ten at night and the TV is off. You know, there's no stations, and now there's always something to do. And so I don't know if if I was that kind of person, you say, "Oh, we're 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 heading for a real crisis." 
So, so I love the idea of Paul Bloom pl- practicing his trombone at 10 p.m. because the television went off and the neighbors that's, banging on. That sounds like a terrible euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I'm just being literal. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that distraction, I mean, we can feel it. I'm sure you can feel it. I can feel it. It's harder for me today to read a novel than it was eight years ago because I've trained myself to expect novelty in every moment. It's harder for me to sit on a park bench and, and, and stare at a park and look at nothing but the clouds than it was eight years ago because I get fidgety. I get itchy. I want to pull the phone out and see what people are arguing about. Yeah. And and because of that, um, I'm exactly the same. And because I go for a walk and I say, I'm not going to look at my phone, I bring it, but I'm not going to look at my phone. And then I like staring at it as I walk. And a walk is a lot less satisfying because each moment is sort of more satisfying than a split second of boredom. But y- you you give up the entire experience. Another thing is, is watching movies at home where I know I'll enjoy a movie a lot more if I shut out the lights, put the movie on loud, and just stare at it. But sometimes I find my hand reaching for my phone, mm. look up something, check something. And in that instant, it's more pleasurable, but the overall experience fades. And you take the story of your story of a walk, my story of a movie, expand it to a life. Mm. And that's and that's the problem. It's terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying. Yeah, the idea of waking up on your deathbed going, wow, I was distracted this whole time. What happened? What <laughs> What have I been doing for eight years? What? Tell me. Now, now my my friend Dan Gilbert, he's a psychology professor at Harvard, and he always argues with me about it. He says, no, no, man, be a hedonist. Because it's true that I occasionally look back and say, my life sucks. I'm ashamed of myself. I've done nothing. But how long do you do that for? A minute? Two minutes? Ten minutes? Well, if the other 23 hours and 50 minutes are spent in hedonic bliss, you're so ahead of the game. He's being cheeky. He's being cheeky. He's not entirely being cheeky. Because the, the nature of the um, the nature of the pleasure when you're being hedonistic is also laced with guilt and unfulfillment, I think. Unless you're, a, unless you're an idiot, you're aware that what you're doing is self-destructive and pointless and fruitless when you're being needlessly hedonistic, right? So it's not even like a pure pleasure. Yeah. And there is a pleasure to be found in the running of the marathon. I must say, I've yep. never found it in the case of the marathon. But the, you know, in, in analogous things that I can imagine uh, that are difficult, uh, there is a pleasure to be found that's underlying the the pain, even even in the experiencing of the thing. And maybe that is an anticipatory sense of your own gratitude after the fact or something. But he's being cheeky to conflate uh, moment by moment hedonism with like all pleasures are not alike, right? I mean, the the pleasure of yeah. furiously masturbating and shoving your face with ice cream is is pleasurable on one level, but it is also tinged with a kind of regret that is not present when you're up to something big that's your truest calling. You're right that some pleasures are laced with shame, though he uh, he like he invites you to imagine you're in Aruba. This is great. The weather's great. You're swimming in the ocean. You're feeling just terrific. You know, your belly's full. You're at, you know, and some pleasures are not late. Some pleasures are just fun. But yeah, but that's great for is, three days. And then you go yeah. on the, on day four, you're like, what the fuck am I doing in Aruba? I, I gotta, I gotta do something with my life. And, and that's a deep truth, which is there's a sense in which the choice to be a hedonist is self defeating, which is pursuing pleasure in a certain point that for his own sake, you get bored. You get bored, you get sated. And, uh, you know, psychologists call it a hedonic treadmill. You, run, you keep running fast and fast, but you don't go anywhere. Mm. And, um, and, and so uh, because of this, so now I actually read a neuroscientist. He says, well, the solution is keep finding more and more interesting new pleasures. But sooner or later, you run out. And sooner or later, you, you, you just, <laughs> you know, it, it terrifies me what this man's going to be like 20 years from now. Yeah. Um, so... The solution is give up on pleasure a little bit and, you know, raise, raise a family, you know, start a business, write a book, do something awful and boring and slow and meaningful. And if you're lucky, by the by, you'll be happy with it mm. and you'll have lived a good life. It's a bit depressing, isn't it? The hedonic treadmill and the, the fact that pleasures that were really titillating, fade over time or at least with repetition I've, I've been noticing this lately and i wonder what you make of it in your thinking about suffering versus pleasure that there are things that i did for the first time in my 
20s yeah. that were so amazingly outrageously fun. Like, can you fucking believe that I've just burnt my frequent flyer miles on, you know, Singapore Airlines first class? I've got a whole room in the sky. There's a shower on the plane. Like, you know, ridiculous uh, crap like that. And then, you know, I'm 10 years later, 15 years later, I'm doing it for the fifth time. Great. It's really cool. I love this game. You get, you get the hot towel and you say, you get, it's not as hot as it should be. It's a little bit. It's warm. I mean, it's it's a warm even, cup. It's not even that I become an enormous, you know, rich wanker whiner. It's just that it's great and also not novel. Not yeah. novel. And that has sapped my life of a considerable amount of pleasure. The erasure of novelty. There's some sort of proverb um, if, if a couple gets together. And each time they make love for the first year, they put a, a little stone in a container next to the bed. And then after that, they remove a stone each time they make love. <laughs> and the container, the container will never be empty. Um, right, and, right. You know, yeah. Yeah. You, you, get, you, get used, you get used to things. Yeah. You get, you, you get used to pleasures. First class is, you know, I remember the first time I flew business, it was amazing. And then later on, you know, the hot towel's not so hot and they had better peanuts to last flight. And you're kind of grumping. And you get used to things. Um, I think this is one reason not to be a heathenist because the longer goods, the satisfaction of a long-term project, you know, you don't have the same jolts, high jolts, but you also don't get don't don't get sated with it as quickly. Mm. I mean, there's also something else, which is it's not just in your twenties; these were that was the first time. It's also you were in your twenties, yeah. And there's an and intensity. There's an intensity of youth which fades. There's all this research finding for happiness. It's very good news. You start off, it drops, and then you're about 50, mm. and it's at the lowest point on average. Then it starts creeping back up. And people in their 70s and 80s often report the happiest times in their lives. And I think it's true, but it's not the intense, crazy happiness of being 20. No, it's, it's satisfaction. Not falling it's not kind of, isn't it? Jonathan yeah, Rausch has the book about that, the happiness That's right, curve. that's right. Yeah. It's very reassuring to me in my 40s that this is the low point. I'm like, okay, good. I'm looking forward to, to it. Bad as, it's gonna, as bad as it's going to get. You're going to hit like, I think David Brooks called it the second mountain, the sort of thing where you start you start focusing on different things and so on. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence and empathy and what it's going to do to our minds. Um, I want to thank you for uh, for being here for our free listeners and our, uh, our premium subscribers. We'll get the the next portion of the chat. So uh, so thanks thanks so much for being with us. And if people want to subscribe, uncomfortableconversations.substack.com. Um, I'm I wonder what it's going to be like in ten, fifteen, twenty years when we're walking through our lives interacting with machines as if they were sentient setting aside the question of whether they ever will be, um, what do you think will happen to our sense of empathy, personhood, ourselves, our fellow man, when machines are indistinguishable from living things? To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with the Substack.